Um, hello, everybody. So I guess let's, uh, you guys, I promise you all a little bit of Hamilton. So let's see if we can make this happen. I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens. That's it, sorry. Uh, so you guys will have to uh, shell out however much you have to pay to go to see that show now or just wait a couple of years. Um, but so that, so that song, uh, The Room Where It Happens, is in the second half of Hamilton. And it's, uh, it's this amazing song where Aaron Burr sings about uh, the compromise that Alexander Hamilton made with uh, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson to move the, where he agreed to let the capital move from New York City down to DC in exchange for help getting his debt plan through. Um, and, and in the song, Burr is singing about how he wants to be in the room where it happens. He's got this incredible envy. It does such a great job of capturing Burr's incredible envy of Hamilton's proximity to power. And I think that really speaks to an interesting universal feeling that we all have, this feeling of like you want to be heard, you want to be in the room, you want to have an impact on things. And when I was watching, when I, got a, the, I had the, the good fortune of getting to see the play, and like, as I was watching that, something really clicked into place for me, and it's about some stuff I've been thinking about for a while. So, um, we'll get back to Hamilton and theater in a little bit. Uh, right now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Edward M. Kennedy Institute Senate Immersion Module. This was a, a project that we worked on for a couple of years with our friends at ESI Design. Pete over there um, also helped with some of the design. Uh, our friends at Control Group and Richard Lewis Media Group, and, uh, and also at the UMK Institute in, up in Boston. And what this is, is it's a, it's a big, basically 100-person Senate LARP um, that kids come in and play for about two and a half hours. Uh, they come in, we swear them all, we make them raise their, their right hand and swear them all in as senators. Um, we, they take pictures, they use these tablets, they make a senator profile uh, that sort of starts to insert them into the game. Then they move off to different rooms where they get to interview nominees and talk to uh, uh, expert witnesses to really begin to learn about issues, um, like things like immigration or healthcare or the Patriot Act, um, also some historical ones, and uh, like the Compromise of 1850. And as, it, as they're doing that, after they start learning a little bit, they start to begin to be able to talk and interact with this. And at this point, we really like, it's not so, it, we try and d dial back us talking to them and give them more room to interact, um, start asking questions, start crafting this piece of legislation they've all come there to do. Um, and then they come back to the, to the chamber, which is this amazing recreation of the, of the Senate chamber. Um, and they give speech, they deliver speeches for and against different provisions, and they all vote on those. And at the end, uh, there's a big vote on this omnibus bill, and it, either it passes or it doesn't pass. Usually they, they get something done, um, more than our, you, know, you might say about our, our Senate in Washington. Um, and, uh, and it's a sort of this amazing two and a half hour experience. And then the kids uh, get back on the bus, go back home. Um, and so in the first uh, year of operation, it opened up last spring, uh, and they've put some, somewhere around uh, 5,000 kids through it. It runs four days a week for groups of up to 100. Uh, and they've, you know, they've, they've, they've booked up the first year, a lot of kids coming back, a lot of uh, teachers bringing their classes back the next year. So it's really exciting. It feels like a really interesting model for how something like this works. And as we were making it, we thought a lot about uh, the design of it. And, and then also, like, what, like, but also, like, some of the things we did were, like, we kind of almost were surprised by um, uh, and the, sort of the, how they worked out. And so hopefully we're going to try and unpack a little bit of that in this talk. But I think before we uh, move on, so that was my brief description of the sort of functional part of the sim, uh, the, what, that's our shorthand name for this in an immersion module. Um, I'm going to let this guy explain it a little bit better. This is a piece of video I edited together very, very roughly. Um, Barack Obama, the president, was at the opening of the, of the institute last year and gave a, a nice little talk about it where he actually talked about the game. Um, so it's hard for our children to see it. in the noisy and too often trivial pursuits of today's politics the possibilities of our democracy, our capacity together to do big things. And this place can help change that. It can help light the fire of imagination, plant the seed 
of noble ambition in the minds of future generations. Imagine a gaggle of school kids clutching tablets, turning classrooms into cloakrooms and hallways into hearing rooms, assign an issue of the day and the responsibility to solve it. Imagine their moral universe expanding as they hear about the momentous battles waged in that chamber and how they echo throughout today's society. Great questions of war and peace, the tangled bargains between North and South, federal and state, the original sins of slavery and prejudice, the unfinished battles for civil rights and opportunity and equality. Imagine the shift in their sense of what's possible the first time they see a video of senators who look like they do, men and women, blacks and whites, Latinos, Asian Americans, those born to great wealth, but also those born of incredibly modest means. Imagine what a child feels the first time she steps onto that floor, before she's old enough to be cynical, before she's told what she can't do, before she's told who she can't talk to or work with, what she feels when she sits at one of those desks, what happens when it comes her turn to stand and speak um, so I think he does a really good job of, I, I kind of gave the sort of the functional description of it. And what he does is, I think, so well is like talk about like what are some of the effects on people. And we saw, really saw that when we were playing it with kids. Um, and there's a real interesting question in, in why. Um, and I think we'll get to that in a moment. So first I want to digress a little bit and say, tell you how much I love live games. I love liveness, this concept of liveness. We've, we've made everything from gigantic fighting puppet battles like this one in Times Square. Uh, to games like this, remote control. This was Sesame Street box heads. Um, it's so basically remote control parents. That little girl's getting to, to run everyone into a, each other and control all of them. Um, we've also done things like gigantic dodgeball battles to simulate civil war battles, uh, water balloon fights. Um, also about a civil war battle, the, the Battle of the Ironclads, um, clearly. Uh, and I've been making these games for years, and I've and I kind of I always thought, like, uh, I really enjoy making them. I love them. And I thought, like, why do I like these? And I always thought it was sort of because I just like watching people play them. Like, there's a real joy in getting to be there when they actually do the thing. They play the game. Right? You make a, I've made lots of video games. I worked at Game Lab, and we've made a number of video games at Gigantic Mechanic. Um, but you sort of ship those off, and you don't get to see what happens to them. But when you make this live game, and you get to be there and see it and see the joy on people's faces and see how people interact. It's incredibly addictive for, as a game designer. I basically thought that was sort of why I like making these things. And I think that that's a big part of it, but I think there's more to it um, than that. So we also run, a, Matt mentioned this, this is the Come Out and Play Festival, um, which is uh, July 8th and 9th. Um, some of our fellow organizers are also in the room, Pete uh, and Deborah, I think, might be here. So they're also helping us organize this. So if you're in town, um, I know a lot of you have been before, some designers I saw earlier, Dalton. Um, uh, it should be a ton of fun. Um, so I highly encourage you to come out and, and play games with us. Um, but, uh, but so there's, the, the, I, you know, enjoying like why these games are live. Like I, every time I get people in a room, I kind of can't help but want to play a game. So it's game time. We're going to actually play a game now. Uh, I've got you all here. There's, some, there's something amazing that you all came down here. You all like put on clean pants and shirts and took the subway and stood in line for 45 minutes outside. And now you're inside. And, uh, and so we're going to play a game together because uh, we're all here together. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't. So we're going to play a game uh, called Would You Rather There Be No? And so uh, this or that. And it's, this is a game of black and white. If you have kids, you I'm sure have played a version of this in a car ride at some point. Um, these are very stark choices that you're going to have to make. And we're going to do this through acclamation. Um, I'll show you the choice that you have. And then, uh, then I'll give you a, a chance to, um, I'll ask you, would you rather have this one, there be not this one, there be none of this, or none of this? And you guys will all vote. And I need, but I, I need you guys to yell. So can I, get a, can I just you know, get a, a test of the room? How many, how many people are here? Can I get a, everyone say aye. Aye. Louder. Aye. All right, are you guys ready to play? Yes. All right, okay. All right, so first off, uh, would you rather uh, get rid of hamburgers or get rid of french fries. So all those in favor of getting rid of hamburgers, say aye. Aye. All those in favor of getting rid of french fries, say aye. Aye. Oh, close. Hamburgers? Aye. French fries? Aye. 
All right, french fries are gone. Um, we got to keep the protein, uh, the carbs are gone. All right, uh, for all the nerds in the room, would you rather get rid of Star Trek or get rid of Star Wars? So all those in favor of getting rid of Star Trek, say aye. Aye. All those in favor of getting rid of Star Wars, say aye. Aye. Star Trek? Star Wars? Aye. I'm going to get rid of Star Trek. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm also going to add my vote to that one. Star Trek, gone. Uh, all right, get rid of Hillary or Trump. Um, this may want to be an easy one in this room. All those who want to get rid of Hillary. Aye. All right, all those who want to get rid of Trump. Aye. Hillary? Aye. All right, Trump? Aye. All right, I think uh, Trump's gone. All right, get rid of Hillary or get rid of Obama. This is the mean they, they don't exist. They just don't exist. All those who'd rather get rid of Hillary? Aye. All those who'd rather get rid of Barack Obama, President Obama? Aye. Oh, okay. <laughs> what lone voice down there in the middle? Um, statue man. Uh, I won't call out any names. Uh, so it sounds like uh, Hillary wins. Or should we get rid of Hillary? So Obama wins that one. All right, get rid of guns or abortion? means this doesn't exist. All those who would rather get rid of guns, say aye. Aye. All those who would rather get rid of abortion. Oh, wow, perfectly silent. <laughs> Unanimous. All right. Uh, get rid of public education or get rid of clean energy. <laughs> All right. All those who would rather get rid of public education. Aye. Get rid of, oh, get rid of, oh, get rid of clean energy. Public education? Aye. Clean energy? Aye. Well, that's like a tie. I guess we have to get rid of both. Um, all right, get rid of games or get rid of change. Um, what, are you, what are you guys really here for? Why are you really here? Um, all right, all those of you are getting rid of games. Aye. All those of you are getting rid of change. Aye. Wow. All right. Um, I was not expecting that answer. Um, so, uh, you know, some, you know, something simple, and, and you're right, this game does suck. Uh, <laughs> but there's something about, like, the, the feeling of, like, being here and all doing this. I feel like I kind of know all of you just a little bit better. Or maybe I know the Games for Change audience a little bit better. And it's even, like, with silly little interactions, you, like, there's something about us all being in, the, in here and doing that and just yelling and the, sort of the, 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 the energy in the room is, is really interesting. And I think that's what's kind of like, that's what's interesting about live games in some ways. How do you think about those? Um, like what that is exactly. And so after we did EMK, we thought, started thinking a lot about like, that was a really cool experience. What made it cool? Was it the big Senate chamber? Was that, was that it? Was it just that it turns out that kids like, you know, being in this big thing? Or is it the tablets? Is it the talking to one another? Um, like where's the, where's the magic here? So. We started thinking a lot about like, well, theater does that. Theater's been doing similar things like this for a long time. So we you know, went back to, uh, to looking at theater. Let's go, so we went on a big tour. We went and saw lots of interactive theater and immersive theater thinking like, well, that's where, that, that's where things are really interesting right now. There's this really nice moment right now where uh, game designers and theater people are starting to like, think like, oh, we ought to talk to one another. There's a, how are we gonna, we're both doing similar sorts of things. How do we make theater more interactive? How do we make games more theatrical? Um, so we went and saw a bunch of those, things like the Ealing Estate or Eight Players, which is a sort of how to host a murder, um, but much sillier. Um, also did a bunch of reading. And uh, there's this great book, this great little diatribe of a book by Jordan Tannehill called Theater of the Unimpressed. Um, and, and in it, he uh, talks uh, a lot about, like, what's the, what's the value of theater? Like, why make theater now, right? Um, you know, this is pretty awesome. Like, that kid's, like, he's not going to the theater anytime soon. He's just chilling, watching Netflix. Um, it's really nice to be at home on your couch. And, and Tannehill asked the question of like, how does theater justify, it, justify itself, right? If, um, if uh, movies and Netflix and TV shows are so amazing, um, why go to the theater anymore? Why not just stay at home and watch Netflix? Why not? Or maybe, maybe go out to a movie theater um, and see something. And I think it's actually a totally valid question. And as Tannehill, who's a theater person himself, points out, a lot of it's better written than, um, a lot of like, movies and TV shows are better written than you know, a lot of local theater. Um, and so what about it is, uh, is, is important. And what he really lands on is that it's this idea of the, the magic of liveness, right? It's like why, it has to, it has to take advantage of being live. And so he, he puts it really well. It's like he, he, he talks about how, 
the, going to the theater confronts you with the humanity of other people. Like you're all in the room together. Like we play this silly little game together and we're all sort of confronted with each other's opinions. Um, uh, and that's, that's a really important thing because it helps you know people. So, and, and where this really clicked into place, as I said earlier, was when I was watching Hamilton. It wasn't in any of the interactive theater. Those were great, but it was when I was, went and saw Hamilton and I got to the moment where he's singing that song and I was like, whoa, there's something amazing here. There's ultimate, you know, what is like the, the, the energy in this room? It's sort of generated between these two things, between the people who help you here on stage and the people out here in the audience. Um, and as Tannehill puts it really, in a really nice way, I think, there's this idea that ultimately liveless is an embodied awareness of time, space, audience, and the specter of failure present in every moment, right? You, you watch even like Hamilton or something like that where you know they, you know when they know what they're doing and you're always, are they gonna mess up? Are they gonna get through it? How am I relating to everyone else in here? How are we all whooping it up or not? You know, in this way that you don't at home. Um, and it goes back to something from that first talk about like as you guys are listening to like a joke in a room and like, and you hear other people laugh and it sends off those little dopamine signals. I think that's the scientific answer to this. And then there's the sort of just the magical answer, I think, which is that there's this energy that, that, com that comes into being. Um, and so he thinks a lot about like how, like, uh, and then we, we kind of comes to the answer about that, about this value of liveness by looking at like something that film taught us, right? So film in some ways revealed the power of liveness. Before there was recorded media, before you had movies and uh, you, sorry, uh, before you had movies uh, and other things like that, Everything, you know, plays were just what there was, right? And so as you, but once you have recorded media, then you start to have a relationship with those things. And suddenly, movies and TV, they can do certain things that theater have been trying to do much better. Um, so realist uh, theater or the, the well-made play, they, you know, there's, there's this divide between you. There's this artificiality where you can't cross versus that, you know, film and media can cross those. Film and TV, they can cross those barriers. You can do close-ups. And so you get to be able to simulate, um, uh, a certain level of reality better than you can in theater. So theater has to f like figure out what does it do better. If it doesn't do realism as well, what does it do better? And it does liveness. This, the, the, you know, again, what he called the, you know, the, the everyone in the room and that sense of failure and that sense of empathy. So I think there's a way that we can use that same lesson and apply it to games. So we've been playing live games for ages. It's, you know, since we could, uh, people have been playing soccer since they could figure out how to get a pig's bladder and dry it and kick it around you know, uh, a field or play Mancala or chess. Like those are live games. Um, and then suddenly you know, video games kind of come up along and they take over. So what are they doing? What is like, the, the technology doing that uh, is superseding live games and, or like, uh, the value of live action games? And so if we look at civilization here, there's tons of variables going on here, way more than anyone can track. And so live games have to give up on that. You can't do complexity like this in a live game. You shouldn't try. Uh, leave that to technology to do. Leave that to digital technology to do. Um, live games don't do storytelling as well uh, as uh, video games. They can't control the camera. Uh, they can't make you look certain places. They may do role playing better, um, but they, they, can't, uh, lead you on, they can't put you on rails and lead you through a story in quite the same way as a digital game. So those are some of the things that digital games are just going to do better. So what are live games going to do better? They're going to if we're gonna modify Tannehill's quote, the magic of live games stems from an embodied awareness of time, space, and other players, and the specter of failure present in every move. So what does all that mean? How do you design to tap into the magic of liveness? Um, so how do you get to this moment where you got this kid, these guys came uh, to the, to the Senate immersion module, and there, I, that kid looks like he is fully engrossed in that game. He believes he's a senator, he's enacting that, he's, in, he's embodying that role, and he, this kid wants something from him, and the other guy's like, you gotta give him this, I don't know, his, his, uh, his friend back there is, I'm back you, I'm back you up, I'm whatever you wanna do. Um, and that's like a really magical moment, so how do you get there? How do you get people to that moment, right? Um, and it's kind of simple in a way. Like the secret ingredient is, as always, people. Um, it all, you know, it's, in, it's the same in sports, it's the same in, in role-playing games, it's, you know, because this is a live game, right? Uh, and in this, in this you know, picture here, we've got uh, LeBron James and Steph Curry, um, and there's a basketball involved somewhere in this, but that's not what's really going on here. This is a dialogue between these two people. This is between um, LeBron James and Steph Curry about what, they, what does the other person think the other person's gonna do? That's what makes this game interesting. It's not just throwing the bucket through a hoop or bouncing it. 
It's the interaction between these people. And we see that in the sim, right? It's how these, these kids come in and negotiate with one another and, uh, and, and really bring the thing to life. And they want to argue with one another. Like they, it's like they're, they're confronted with each other. They're willing to take on these roles. And they can do things that no computer can do. No branching dialogue is ever going to match um, the story that like, one of these kids can tell. And they're not gonna, and they're also, no AI is gonna match the weird things that a person will tell you when they react to you. So, t you know, live games have to do that. They have to take advantage of people. They have to put them front and center and use them as a way to learn because that's where a lot of, like, it, like in theater, like, it gives you this chance to empathize with people around you and learn from them. And so live games have to, to take that into account and put that front and center for people. Um, they're also about space. So and, uh, in the, the case of this game right here, there's a, what's that, about a foot and a half? Um, and that's, a, and that's a, a crucial foot and a half in this game. Is that, like, is that enough to, 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 you know, for, for him to get that shot off? Um, it's all about the relationship for these things. And space is important in video games and board games, but it's particularly important in live games because we're casting bodies into space and asking them to interact with each other. So, um, we made a game uh, a couple of years ago. Well, back when we were at Game Lab, my partner Mattia worked on Diner Dash um, along with Nick and um, a bunch of other folks. Um, and uh, in this game, it's sort of a time management game. I'm sure most of you have, or many of you have played Diner Dash at some point. And this is a time management game. You're moving around, clicking on things. And one time uh, we were working with a group and they were like, you guys worked on, you, you, didn't you guys, weren't you guys involved with Diner Dash? Why don't you make us the live action Diner Dash? Um, we're like, all right, I guess we could try that. Um, so we made a game called Short Order. Now we've got here our four waiters. They're going to be. So this is basically Hell's order. Kitchen for little kids. <laughs> Sometimes the kitchen gets a little crazy. These guys will get a little nuts in there. So you don't be afraid to yell out stuff that you need them to bring. So it's, I need three browns, or I need two yellows, or I need an orange, and they'll bring them to you. Okay? Yeah. High fives all down the line. I want a good service today. <laughs> <laughs> and what makes this game magical, I think, for people playing it is. The way that the bodies are moving in space, right? Like, they, and the, the, these kids all getting this chance to yell at them. So they're just basically doing color matching. But uh, we very cleverly and, or meanly lay out all of the fruits and vegetables in a way that they all have to run around and try not to bounce into each other. And it's amazing to watch little kids do it. But even as an adult, and you play it, you get that same feeling. It's like you get this feeling of expertise of like my body and like how am I using it in in, uh, in space. And that's a really interesting and important like, emotion in, um, to evoke and a really good way to get people to embody things. Um, along with, uh, and so in The Sim, the, you know, we do, it has similar elements to that as well, right? There's this space of The Sim, like of the, where that's taking place. And you know, there's a little bit of like, set dressing for that, but it's really about like, how are you like, using this space? You know, you, and here, I wouldn't think so much about this chamber as here we have 100 people together. And later on, we're going to break them into smaller groups, and there'll be five people together or 15 people together, and they can talk in different ways. And that's really important, like how you begin to have people relate to the space and to each other. Time is a crucial element, obviously, in many sports. Uh, uh, so the, the, the time element, I think, is, is very important. Oftentimes, like when you talk to game designers, and uh, I teach game design at NYU, and um, and and have worked with lots of people making games over the years, and people are like, I'm always one of the first thing, questions I ask people is like, well, how long do you want someone to play your game? And people, and never, the inevitable answer is usually, the inevitable answer is forever. They're going to play this forever. I'm like, that's not true. No one will ever play any game forever. Um, even Michael Jordan gave up on basketball at some point, and went to play baseball, and then went back. Uh, but uh, there, so there's a sense that games have to be bounded in time, and I think that's one of the really magical things about live games, right? Like, there's something magical about going down to the park to play basketball with your friends, and it makes it feel more important because it's temporary, it's fleeting. It's like there's both time pressure in the game, but there's also time pressure in the, the fact that you're only going to be here together for a certain amount of time, and you have to get something done, and you have to like enjoy this mo and moment and embrace this moment. Um, and so it's something that we try to put into to use in a lot of the games we make. Uh, this is the game Block Party that we made. It's a 15-person it's a video game um, where they're all dropping pieces here. And there's time pressure. They only have two, three minutes to, to finish, the, to score as many points as possible. Um, and their blocks are all falling, which is adding this time pressure to it. But that, like, the, the, all those people, those 15 people being there in that same moment in time and feeling that same pressure leads to really interesting things. So you're always thinking about, we're always thinking about, like, how do we ratchet that up? How do we play with, like, time 
and like make this moment valuable to people and a shared moment. Um, and same with the sim, right? Like you come there, you're there for two and a half hours, and you and it's a it's a limited experience. Like you're there, you're gonna have to make something. There's gonna be a vote at the end of this, and whether you pass something or don't is up to you. Like it, you have to take responsibility for that. And then there's risk. And this goes back to that, that, that this idea of failure. So then there's Steph Curry, the MVP of this year. Was he the MVP last year too? Two-time MVP. Uh, and he just lost the ball to um, Gallinari. He's not a great player. Um, and, uh, and, but, like, but that's how it goes, right? Like without that sense of risk, there wouldn't be the, 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 the real heights of the game. And I think this is true of uh, live games, right? So in the sim, you see it. Like this guy's got to give up a speech. We made this kid give a speech in front of 100 people. And when we were making the game, our feeling, like everyone was told, like, no one's going to want to do that. No one's going to want to give up and, go up and give that speech. It's hard. It's like you're putting people on the spot. And it didn't turn out that was actually that big a problem. A lot of people are willing to do that because you gave them something they uh, could uh, get into. Right? And so you see it in here. Like, these kids, are, they're embodying this thing. Um, uh, they're arguing about really tough things like immigration and slavery. But they're accountable to one another. There's risk, but they're accountable. They're face to face. Imagine this game played online, right? Like a, a game about the compromise of 1850. You couldn't do that online in a dismediated way. It would become a flame war instantly. But when you're there face to face with people, you behave differently. You're accountable to people in a different way. Um, so I th there was a, this moment while we were making the sim that really uh, summed it all up for me. And this is what, you know, we play tested that game in cafeterias and auditoriums and conference rooms all around the, all around the country. And there was this moment where this kid was giving this speech, and it was amazing. Um, this isn't the kid. I don't have a picture of him, unfortunately. But we were in the basement of the EMK Institute for Healthcare. It's a high school up in Boston. And it's, everyone's sweating, and they've been working on making a piece of legislation about the, the Affordable Care Act, and it's super complicated. Like, uh, we, we wrote it, and we barely understood most of it. And somebody just getting, gotten up to give a speech on why uh, religious hospitals should be allowed to be exempt from uh, family, like providing family planning. And this kid has to get up and give the argument. And these girls, they give theirs, and everyone's like, oh, that's good, all right. Um, and they, they, he gets up to argue about it, and he kind of demurs for a moment. And he's like, um, he's like, sometimes, he's like, sometimes you go out and you have a good time. Sometimes you have too good a time. And, and at this point, all the kids in the room get exactly what he's talking about. And half the room breaks out in applause. And the other half's like, boo! And he's like, sometimes in those cases, you just need a little backup. And, and then all the teachers are like, oh my gosh. Um, and we're like, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know he was going to say that. Um, and you know, they take the vote, and, the, and the, the provision gets struck down. He, he wins the vote. And it's that moment you're like, this is amazing. He took this, like, this weird gamble where he's willing to say this kind of um, this thing in front of all of his teachers, in front of his classmates, people were booing him, but like, he's like, he knew how to work that room. He knew exactly what to say at that moment. And it was really special. Um, see, and, and, and people kind of, and that, that, that specialness of like all of them being in the same place, and this feeling of being able to learn from one another. And I think this is why this is super important for Games for Change. I think, you know, a lot of this has been a sort of general talk about like design, but why is this important for Games for Change? Because Oftentimes, if you believe, like I do, that the way to change people's minds is not necessarily through facts and figures, but it's through talking and empathy and negotiating and learning from others, that's the value of live games, right? You're not learning from a computer. A computer is not telling you, spouting a bunch of stuff at you. You're getting to interact with people and see their viewpoint and feel that viewpoint. I think that's super valuable. But they're also, in many ways, easier to make, right? Like, they're, they're cheaper. Like, making a big VR game, that's going to be amazing. and It's going to provide a big experience, but it's going to cost a ton of money. Right? And so there's something that you can get, and you can do so much of this on pen and paper by setting up the right conditions, by like taking advantage of people and liveness and the, the teachers and other people that are there to facilitate stuff. So I'll let uh, Barack Obama take us out. He puts it well in the end. Why I think this is ultimately valuable. On behalf of something she cares about and cast a vote and have a sense of purpose. Maybe just not for kids. What if we all carried ourselves that way? What if our politics, our democracy, were as elevated, as purposeful as she imagines it to be right here?
And I think that's the real value. It's like, it's not just kids play, it's for all of us. So I will leave you with your last moment of magical liveness. Um, it's everywhere, you have to look for it. Thank you guys.